Thank you, Secretary, for being here today. I'm deeply concerned about the fact that your department failed two financial audits for two consecutive years. Uh, after <coughs> inspecting your department numbers, your independent auditor was unable to complete the audit, instead was forced to issue what's known as a disclaimer of opinion, which, uh, by the way, hasn't happened in two decades, uh, and is a really big deal in the auditing world. Uh, your auditor said, in effect, that they had no confidence in your numbers and how the department carries out estimates and assumptions for the direct and FFEL student loan portfolios. Uh, my staff followed up and spoke with your auditor and learned that during the course of the 2023 audit, your department discovered 22,000 anomalies in the data. Uh, that is the basis for, your, for the student loan portfolio. And then, after doing additional investigation, your department discovered another 8 million anomalies in the data. This means that the underlying data you were feeding into the student loan portfolio was just simply filled with errors. Uh, so all in all, a very highly irresponsible financial management from the department, particularly of a $1.6 trillion portfolio owned by 43 million borrowers. If the department were a private bank, you would be held accountable to your investors and you'd be out of business by now. And it certainly undermines any confidence that anyone can have in your estimates and assumptions that the department has used in these portfolios. Why should the Department of Education and the Office of Student Aid be treated any differently than a private financial institution? Thank you for the questions. I agree with you that's really important to make sure that uh, we're up to date on our financial audits. Um, and I just want to correct the statement. It wasn't a failure. It was a disclaimer of opinion. Those are two different things based on the information that they were provided. We're doing new things that have never been done at the Department of Education. Number two, the errors in the data. You're absolutely right. I'm proud that our team found this and is correcting it. It's been there for, for several administrations. It was our team that found it and is fixing it. Um, you know, we operate on two-tenths of 1% of a budget um, for a $1.6 trillion portfolio. We're not being treated like other banks. So what we're asking is for a modest increase in our budget. You're not being treated how? But I'm sorry, I missed it. Fun, no, funding-wise, you know, to, to administer the $1.6 trillion portfolio, we are operating on two-tenths of 1% for administrative costs. We are asking for uh, additional dollars to help make sure that we can uh, but not only implement the, uh, the comments from auditors, uh, but also improve services but, for our but students. But how do you think we should be providing additional funding. Do you think the American taxpayer should be satisfied uh, with the funding that you have today, with the way that you're handling 1.6 trillion in taxpayer dollars? We found the errors and we're correcting that. We're providing better services and it's our goal to do a better job pro providing services for our borrowers. Your support of the budget would help that. I wanna to get to um, the uh, clock hour rule, uh, which is, uh, the department has reversed what is known as the clock hour rule, which allows uh, career oriented, or oriented uh, education programs that are offered at community colleges and career colleges to provide students with the education, with the amount of hours that they feel that students need uh, to be successful in the career, uh, the specifically to extend the number of hours uh, to more than 150% uh, of the state's minimum, and then still receive the federal financial aid. And as I said, that policy, um, it's, it's important for a lot of these programs, they're mm -hmm. complicated uh, careers, and the schools and the students uh, feel they need additional hours to be adequately prepared. So I think that policy is gonna result in less students having access to education and, and uh, that will lead them to these good paying jobs. Um, in response to industry, industry concerns, the department announced that it will use, and I, I quote, enforcement discretion uh, when enforcing the rule between July of 2024 and January of 2025. But there's no guarantee for schools that they'll be given the time they need to get all the necessary approvals by state legislators, accrediting agencies, and federal regulators. So first, why, why the policy in the first place? Why would the government mandate that schools can only offer a bare minimum of hours to students? Thank you uh, for that question. Look, I think we're on the same page. We wanna make sure we have opportunities for students to 
engage in, whether it's CTE or industry-connected fields. Uh, we want to make sure that while we're providing greater opportunities, we're also providing high-quality programming. But what I'm hearing from you is that there's some concerns, and we want to make sure that we're listening and responsive to the concerns. So I'll ask my I team to follow I want to ask one additional question. I'm running out of time. Um, you, you mentioned discretionary enforcement. I don't know exactly what that means. Can you simply delay the full implementation of the rule until January 2025? Thank you, sir. We'll take that into consideration, and I'll have my team follow up with you on those. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and I yield back.